Thank you, Bart. So today I will talk about Format Preserving Encryption, or FPE. So FPE is widely used in practice to encrypt credit card numbers or fields in legacy databases. In those systems, the uh, data have to follow some certain format dictated by the schema. If you use an ordinary encryption scheme, then you would destroy the format and crash the system. In contrast, under FPE, ciphertext will always have the same format as the plain text. For example, if you encrypt a credit card number, then the ciphertext will also look like a credit card number. Therefore, using a FPE would avoid disrupting the system. So syntactically, an FPE scheme is just a tweakable block cipher on the general domain. So an FPE scheme will take as input a key and a tweak to deterministically map a message in the domain to a ciphertext in the same domain. So why would one need tweaks to encrypt? To understand the needs for tweaks, uh, let's consider the following scenario where we store credit card numbers in a database. So in the first table, we store the customer's names together with their credit card numbers. In the second table, we store the transaction numbers together with the corresponding credit card numbers for the purchase. If you combine the two tables, we can realize that uh, John Doe made the first and second transactions. Now, suppose we encrypt the credit card numbers by FPE under the same key and tweak. Because FPE is deterministic, encrypting the same message twice under the same key and tweak would result in the same ciphertext. Therefore, if you combine the two encrypted tables, you can still realize that John Doe made the first and second transaction as before. In contrast, if you encrypt the two tables under different tweaks, then although one can still realize that transactions one and two were made under the same credit card number, now there's no way you can link that to Chondo anymore. Therefore, using tweaks would improve the privacy in the context of FPE. So the annoying obstacle in designing FPE is that, unlike conventional block ciphers such as AES, here the domain can be quite small. For example, if you encrypt uh, social security numbers, your domain size is just about 2 to the 30. So as I mentioned earlier, FPE uh, is widely used in practice, and the, two important, uh, the most important schemes are NIST standards, FF1 and FF3. Both are based on Fiesto Network. However, there have been a number of attacks on those standards. For example, my prior work with Mihir Blari and uh, Stefano Tessero gave a message recovery attack on Fiesto Networks, which applies to both FF1 and FF3. The attack is uh, very expensive, and it just recovers a single target message. On the plus side, it is non-adaptive, and needs very few known messages per tweak. With uh, Stefano and uh, Nitrio, subsequently we improved the attacks in uh, uh, some fronts, such as uh, the amortized data complexity. But uh, timing remains as expensive as before. So in a different direction, Durak and Voronate uh, exploited a design bug in FF3 to recover the entire codebook the attack, however, is very specific to FF3, meaning that it doesn't apply to FF1. Moreover, they need uh, adaptive queries. So all attacks so far are expensive, requiring at least n to the fifth operations where you attack the domain Zn times Zn. So they are only suitable on small domains. But today, I will show you how to improve a DV attack to reduce the running time from n to the fifth to almost n cubed. So this is uh, the very first attack 
uh, on FF3 that is feasible on moderate and large domains. So there's a more detailed comparison between uh, our attack and DV. So as I mentioned earlier, for the timing, we are much better. The two attacks essentially have um, is the same asymptotic data complexity, but DV ought for a more aggressive choice of parameters to improve the recovery rate. So concretely, for data complexity, uh, our attack is slightly better. So before we get into the technical details of the attack, uh, let me briefly review the attack notion that we are considering. So our attack is just a chosen plain text attack that is, the adversary is given an encryption oracle to query uh, messages and tweaks of its choice to receive the corresponding server text. The goal of the adversary here is very ambitious. It wants to recover the entire code book on every tweaks that it queries. So here's a uh, bird's eye view of FF3. It is just an 8 route Firestore network. The picture here shows four out Feisto. But unlike conventional Feisto where the operator is XR, here we consider a generic uh, abelian uh, uh, group operator uh, plus. So our attack works on a general domain ZM times ZN, where M is greater than N. And in contrast, uh, the DB attack only consider the balance setting, namely M is equal to n. So under a well-designed Firestore network, then if you encrypt under different tweaks, then encryption should appear independent. However, in MF3, for any tweak t, you can find a related tweak t prime so that encryptions under these tweaks have some sort of similarity. In particular, if encryption under tweak t is a cascade of to four file Feistel network F and G, that encryption under T prime is the cascade of G and F. So this, this similarity allows one to mount what is known as a uh, slide attack by Alex Brunop and David Wagner. So in particular, we first create a query change under tweak T as follow. So we start at a random point U0 and query that to the encryption oracle on the tweak T to get a point U1. We then query U1 to the encryption oracle on the tweak T again to get another point U2 and so on. So by repeating this process, we obtain a change on the tweak T. Likewise, we can obtain another chain on the tweak T prime for a random point V0. So here I sh I'm showing just one query per tweak. But in the paper, we consider, uh, uh, sorry, one change per tweak. But in the paper, we can consider multiple chains per tweak. Our goal is that some chains per tweak T will, sub will eventually collide and then merge with another chain per tweak T prime. Note that the functions f and g here are permutations because they are for our Feisto. Therefore, if collision does happen, and it must happen at the beginning of some chain. Now, if a chain's length is 2p, and we use s chains per tweak, then we can consider s square p positions for collision. A true collision would give us p pairs of known plain text, several text for f and g, but we don't know which point is the true one. So essentially, we have a situation of needle in haystack. So we have a haystack of uh, MN instances, but uh, at most one of them would give us the needle, namely a true collision. So how would we find the needle then? So it's instructive to see how DV managed to resolve this. But remember that they only consider the balance setting where M is equal to N. So they first developed a codebook recovery attack on 4 out Feisto with time uh, n cube. Then it used that on every instance. So if we can recover the codebook on a particular instance, that must be a true instance. So we are done. 
But if we fail to recover code book on some instance, so that is probably a false instance. Just reject it. So because there are n square instances, and each needs n cube time, uh, so totally, there will be, you will need n to the fifth running time. So that is expensive. How can we do better? So first of all, recall that DV use an expensive code book recovery attack on every single instance. This is wasteful because all but one instances are false. So one better find a cheap distinguishing attack to eliminate uh, all the, most of the false instances first. And then later, uh, the, run the code book recovery attack on the remaining one. But even then, this is expensive because DV's recovery attack is expensive using n cube time. So we therefore develop an improved attack using just uh, n to the five thirds time. And it works in the general case as well. So because the bottleneck of our attack is in the distinguishing part, so for the rest of the talk, I will focus on this part. But before we get into the technical details, let's try to understand what is required for the distinguishing attack. So here we are given P pairs of known plain text, several text for H of F and G. So the distinguisher has to tell whether the several text were produced in a real world, namely produced under a 4 out 5 store, or uh, they were produced in a random world, namely by a random permutation. So in the real world, we want the distinguisher to output correctly with high probability, say a half. So there's only a true instance there. We can't afford to miss that. Uh, on the other hand, in the random world, we want the distinguisher to output incorrectly with very, very small probability, say in a proportional to about 1 over square root of m. So why square root? The reason is that we run the test twice for x instance one for f and another for g. So for false instance, the chance that you incorrectly accept it would be at most 1 over m. And if you have m and false instances, and expectedly, there are just about n instances that survive the test. So the key idea of our attack is based on the fact that Feinstein network exhibits some sort of bias when you encrypt uh, inputs of uh, the same row halves. In particular, consider two inputs, x and x prime, that have the same row half. And for convenience, let me call the colliding. So let's now encrypt them under the four row Feinstein network and look at the difference on the left halves of the several text C and C prime. So it turns out that the distribution of this one picks at the point uh, left half of x minus left half of x prime. The gap between the peak and a uniform mass is too small to exploit directly. But this can be amplified if we have enough plain text, several text pairs. And for our convenience, uh, we'll call uh, two pairs x, c, and x prime, c prime matching. If the difference on the left halves of the plain text, it's exactly that of the separate text. So in our attack, we call LHD, would compute Q, the number of two pairs of plain text, separate text that are colliding. Now we ask ourselves questions. What, uh, how many uh, two pairs out of those Q would be matching? You would have a different answer, depending on whether you are in the real world or random world. So in particular, there's a big gap between the expected value, D0, in the random world, and its counterpart, D1, in the real world. So, and this gap corresponds to the bias that I mentioned earlier. But now, it is amplified by a factor of Q, because we have the Q2 pairs. So therefore, we will set up a threshold uh, as a weighted average of D0 and D1. If the number of the uh, two uh, matching pairs is beyond this threshold, 
we are probably in the real world and we should output one. Otherwise, if uh, it is below the threshold, so we are probably in the random world and we should output zero. So how fast is test? So at the first class, we are given P pairs of plain text, table text. So at best, uh, we probably can do at most linear time of that, but that is too slow for our purpose. To speed things up, we develop a pre-processing of M and time, but this one is needed only once for all of the instances. With this common pre-processing, we can speed the, the running time of LHD by almost a factor of n. So this one is uh, somewhat fast, but how good is that? So theoretically, in the real world, we are output correctly with probability at least uh, 0.78 when m and n are greater than 64. And the bigger m and n are, the better our bow is. In the random world, then the chance that we are put incorrectly is at most uh, 1 over square root of m as required. But let me stress that these uh, theoretical estimations are very, very conservative, and empirically we do much better. So experiment shows that in the real world, we always output uh, correctly. In the random world, then we might output incorrectly, but that happens very rarely. So, summing up, today uh, our text shows that the FF3 bug discovered by DV is much more damaging than it was believed. And the good news uh, is that uh, in light of all these attacks, finally NIST decided to uh, update the specification of FF1 and FF3 to deal with them. So if you use FF1, or uh, even worse, FF3 in your system, then it's now time to update. That's all. Thank you. The general uh, setup of uh, having a very low probability event, which is a bit higher than the others, and looking for the needle in the haystack, is exactly uh, um, uh, what was analyzed in a paper we wrote several years ago. Uh, I think it appeared in crypto. Uh, uh, so you may want to look at uh, finding needles in haystacks, uh, because they showed how to trade off time uh, versus space. I believe that your algorithm requires a lot of space because the result of the pre-processing has to be summarized in some uh, large table, isn't it? Um, the pre-processing, I think, uh, you said... Order oh, MN. Yeah, MN. So that, I think that is not that big. Uh, yeah, so depending on how big you are, want to be, but uh, for the one that we experiment, then space is not a bottleneck. But of course, if you want to go to the very big, then yes, you want some sort of trade-off there. So then you may want to look at that paper to see how you can use less space uh, in order to find needles in haystacks. Yeah, thank you, Adi. There's a question over there. So, so you showed that uh, you exploit this algebraic relationship between the tweaks. So you XOR with four, and then uh, it turns out that it's uh, you, you have a collision, which is likely. So, y do you think there are other alg algebraic relations that could be exploited there, or, or how do you know that? Like that's the only one? Or? Um, so at the moment, so NIST restricts the tweak space so that uh, you can uh, so so that you cannot mount this cap uh, attacks anymore. So at the moment, we, we don't know any other way to uh, break FF3 yet. Uh, so, but I cannot, uh, certain, I'm, not, I'm not certain that uh, it is bug free. Yeah, so in the absence of a security proof, then we, that, that, that's the best we can hope for. And so I have to wait for further cryptanalysis. And also you said that, uh, so you showed that, okay, that this attack is a distinguishability attack, real and random, but um, and it's not clear to me how you, how you extract the message from, from that. Oh, okay. So the distinguishing attack is just to uh, tell which instant is the true one. And then you actually have to uh, 
need a, another attack to extract the code book from that. But I am not showing it here because of the time constraint. But I'm happy to talk uh, offline. Okay, but that takes like you do that, that takes like uh, uh, what? How much time it takes to? Uh, let's see. Because uh, this is I the running time. So in, in the balance setting, it's about n to the uh, five thirds if the domain is z n times z n. So you so so you actually. But do you need actually to know that you're in the real? So I, do, I don't. No, no. You need to know that you actually have the correct instance. Because otherwise, you just have noise, and you cannot extract anything from noise. Other question for Adi? We have time, no problem. That's why I waited to see that no one else is uh, asking. Um, in the first few slides, you explained what kind of information still leaks out, and uh, you explained why we need tweakable, no, at the beginning, why we need tweakable uh, crypto systems. Yes, yes exactly. So uh, a proposal I would like to make is the following. This will still leak out the information that uh, the first two transactions uh, were made uh, by the same credit card number. You don't know who is the customer, but you link together. And if something will later be revealed about one of the transactions, it will link the other transactions to it. Why don't you use the time of the transaction uh, as another source of tweak? So you are actually going to encrypt the first transaction and the second transaction. If they were made by the same credit card, almost certainly they were not made at the same time. The time remains unencrypted, and this will make the two credit card numbers, even though they were this belonging to the same guy and the same credit card number, they will look like different credit card numbers in the database. Yeah, I think that uh, is a good uh, suggestion. Uh, so if you use the running t uh, the, the timing, then the tweak will be different, and the cell text would be different. But uh, it depends on how practitioners actually uh, handle that. I think typically they only encrypt a part of the uh, credit card numbers, and then use the rest as tweaks. So that so you time might could uh, get uh, as part of the tweak easily. Yeah, a part of the uh, the credit card number, say the four last digits. As no, the time of the transaction. Yeah, so it is, I'm not sure if they, are, they would do that. That would be a good one as well. But uh, yeah. OK, suggestion. OK, I still have a question. So you didn't explain in detail what NIST changed. Is it only the tweak, the space of They also repeat the number of rounds, and you think it's a good idea what they did, actually? Uh, let's see. So actually, there uh, are two changes, because uh, there are so many attacks. So to, uh, to thwart the DB attack and else, so they suggest that uh, you actually have to restrict the tweak space so that you cannot mount any cap uh, related tweaks anymore. And uh, second is to um, re restrict on the domain size. So they don't accept very tiny domain anymore. So the, um, the, the my earlier work with Mir Polari, Stefano, and Nitrio no longer applies because it is very expensive then. So basically now uh, the domain size should be at least uh, 1 million. Previously, they allow 100. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much.